You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. How are you today? I hope you're uh, doing well. Ryan, are you all right? I'm doing okay. Yeah? Doing okay. I'm a little under the weather today. You, you've assured me it's not COVID, so we're okay. Yeah, I got tested yeah. yesterday for COVID, and mm-hmm. it wasn't COVID, but uh, just like a head cold or a sinus thing, something going on. I got a tele- te- te- tellable. I got a terrible allergy attack because <sighs> uh, the weather changed drastically. Isn't that the worst? I just wonder. Nothing worse than feeling like <laughs> shit, just feeling off. Oh, my God, and it's you all on your face. I mean, I had to interview someone today. Well, that went fine. It went well, but I was, uh, you know, at some points I was just like, oh, my God. But uh, you survived. Got a great guest today. We'll get into that in just a minute. But I want to thank everybody for uh, coming to the shows, the stage at shows. Again, I want to say, you know, uh, uh, on March 5th, we had two shows and it, we did really well. A lot of people showed up. And uh, thank you for supporting my band, Sunspin. And uh, also, if you want to follow the podcast, it means a lot. If, uh, Thank you, by the way, for spending your, your afternoon with us or just an hour with us a week. It's not asking much, but there are a lot of choices, and you choose to be here, and I really appreciate that. So thank you. Uh, what are the handles for our podcast, Ryan? Oh, they're at Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's also an Inside of You online store. If you want to go to that, just go to the Inside of You online store. we got great stuff like Smallville signed lunchboxes from Tom and myself, uh, Inside of You mugs, tumblers. All a bunch of stuff. Just go look at it. There's a lot of great stuff on there. Also, a big shout out to all my patrons. Uh, they give the uh, give back to the podcast in many ways. And if you go to Patreon, p a t r e o n dot com slash inside of you, you can join the wonderful family. There's different tiers and things you get from me and YouTube lives and all this stuff. And I will uh, as soon as you join, I will send you a message thanking you. Inside of you, it's called it's Patreon. Mm-hmm. dot com slash inside of you mm-hmm. and uh <clears throat> i appreciate you listen i appreciate you writing a review if you like the show uh today's guest is uh you know i didn't really know much about him i didn't know much about josh peck and uh he's got a big following you know he talks about being a child actor and how to, how, how he had to grow out of that and uh just you know being on drugs and he was very open and honest he has a new book out and uh, I really enjoyed having him on. Wasn't he, wasn't he fun? He was good. He was. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this one. So let's get inside of Josh Peck. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. I know Ryan. Do you? Yeah, do Ryan uh, Reynolds? I, no, I'm not that fancy. Ryan Filippi? I had I saw him at a fancy LA eatery once. Felipe. And, and the worst the worst part was my mom got there first. So I walk in and I see her talking to Ryan Felipe. He's with his beautiful children. Right. And my mom, as I walk in, goes, You know my son, he's famous too. And I'm like, oh, God, Mom. Your mom did that. <laughs> this is the worst intro ever. Oh, man. Is your mom Jewish? <laughs> I think that's safe to See, say. See, I'm a Jew, so my mom, my mom would do that shit. It's all the my same. My grandmother would do that shit. She feels the urge to anywhere we are. And it's been years. I mean, like, oh, the, the people she's talking to probably don't know Smallville, <laughs> you know, or whatever, or some things that I've done. And she'll go into a restaurant, and the waitress will come over, a server. You can't say waitress anymore. I don't Fair. know what the fuck you could say anymore. I can't say anything. I, I just, just shut my mouth because I just say the wrong thing all the time. Same here. Uh, inadvertently. But, you know, the server will come and go, oh, can I get you some menu? She's like, yeah, my son's famous. My grandson, he's famous. She's like, great. And it's not for you. Like, it could be confused as, like, pride. It's not. It's all self-serving for them. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's for them. It's for them to feel good. It's My mom knows it makes me viscerally, at my (laughs) deepest level, uncomfortable. Do you say anything to her? Every time. Almost (laughs) every time. Big fights over it. Really? Yeah. Like, literally, especially when it's when I'm having rough times and she's, like, pitching me, like, I've got a new show coming out. I'm like, I haven't worked in 19 months, had, haven't had a call back in 11 months, not looking good for me, might have to go, you know, find a real job. And she's like, no, no, you got the magic. And people know. <laughs> I'm like, ma, don't do this. When I'm around you, I feel bad about me. So you- <laughs> When I'm around you, I feel bad about me. Now, is that in your book? Should be. It should be. <laughs> yeah. I like that. 
I mean, you've got a story, man. I, you know, I, what I like is that you see where you come from and, you know, obviously Drake and Josh and, and, and how I met your fathers on Hulu now and yeah. social influencer and all these movies, Turner and Hooch and Red Dawn. And like, you've done so many things and then you write a book. It's like, it's never enough. Josh is now has, he has to be an author. Yes. And, and it's author of, of happy people are annoying, which is a great title. Thank you. That's a really great title because happy people are annoying. Yeah. How are they annoying to you? Well, I just, I always think, but the first thing when I think that, I think of when I'm, I'm out and I'm, you know, I'm single, I'm lonely. And then you see a couple and they're laughing and giggling and I'm like, oh, Ugh. fuck them. Oh, fuck yeah. them. But that's not right. Because why should you be like that way about other people? You want be other people to be happy. But it says something about yourself in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. I, someone said to me the other day, he's like, I don't like forced fun, which is why I don't go to Coachella. Like <laughs> anyone who's capable of forced fun, like we're like, we're going to go to the new Harry Potter thing at Universal Studios. And I'm like, unironically? And they're like, yeah, butterbeer. I'm like, I don't get you. Butterbeer. <laughs> they're hyped. I don't understand you. Or do you think, I mean, look, we'll get into it. But overall, do you think, because I can answer this. Are you a happy person? Do you feel like you are happy? You've gone through a lot in your life. But overall, when you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're by yourself and there's nobody around you, hmm. can you honestly look at yourself in the mirror and look at your reflection and go, I like you. I love you. I'm happy. I think so. I mean, the conceit of the book is like where I started it was throughout most of my life, I'd look at people who were inherently happy or at least exuding what looked like happiness. And I thought, oh, like happiness is reserved for quarterbacks and cheerleaders, <laughs> cheerleaders yeah, yeah. and like people who have like inherited money and people with six packs and like all these things. And I figured that everyone had been handed a manual for life at birth that I was just not privy to. Like I didn't get that. Right. So I was resentful. At, I was like, no, it's, I, you know, things affect me too deeply. I'm too sensitive, too analytical, too neurotic for this world. Right. So I would look at these people and just be like, oh, you don't get it. Like you're you're humming at this weird level that I'll never be at. But like where I'm at, feeling the feelings, this is life. This is real. Exactly. That's There's something truthful about that. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was a short kid. I was the shortest kid in my high school. I didn't start puberty till late. I was, you know, I was picked on. I, I was not popular. And um, going through high school, I would just look around me and go, God, I wish I was that guy. It was all envy. It was like, I wish I was that guy. I wish yeah. I was the quarterback. I wish I had that girl. I wish I can get that. If that girl just gave me the chance, you'd see how funny and sweet I was. But I'll never get that chance. They're happy. I want to be like them. Yes. That's always the feeling. But I don't believe that anybody's truly happy. I think we're all trying to, like you said something about being content. Mm. What is it you said about being content? It was a quote but or something in your book about being content. And yeah. that's the, that's with yourself, just saying, I am good enough. It's like that, that Saturday Night Live thing. What was the, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and God damn it. What does he say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? People like and me. And people like me. Yes. But, you know, it's sort of like, hey, this is me. This is what I've got. And there's these personal traits, these personal things, that these, these things that we do that we just try to escape. Like this makes, I'm annoyed at myself. Mm. I, I don't think you know, I'm like, why would anybody want to be my friend? Why would anybody want to talk to me? Mm. Why would anybody want to, you know, and you start to think that that's who you are and you try to escape it. You try to push it away. Yes. I'll have a cooler personality. I'll be cooler. I'll be quiet. I'll be this, but your real self comes out. Mm. It just comes out. Right. Yeah. I mean, to your point, like that, it took me so long, long to learn the duality of ego and being self-centered. And I used to think much like quarterbacks, like if you're self-centered or you're egotistical, like that's reserved for high achievers. Um, and then someone once told me like, Hey, if you spend all day thinking about how great you are or how awful you are, you're only thinking about you. You're self-centered. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, Oh that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also self-centered. Oh, good. But it's true. Like, I think like the ego and, and I can only speak for myself, but my mind wants me separate from, like, it doesn't want me to be a worker amongst workers. It either wants me to be like, I'm somehow pleased with a performance of mine. And I'm like, well, this verifies my suspicion that I'm the best. <laughs> like, I'm the fucking man. <laughs> 
or 90% of the time I'll see something I dislike or anything, you know, anything can trigger it. Something doesn't work out and I go, I knew it. This is but a preview of more bad to come. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And my mind just wants me all alone instead of being like, yeah, highs and lows, that's life. You know, me yeah. and the next guy. How hard are you on yourself? Do you think you've let up a little bit? Do you think you, over the years, you've just become more like, hey, I'm going to be better to myself? I'm gonna, because I think that's really important to just be good to yourself, to give yourself a break, to say, I'm not perfect, to say, I'm not, I'm not all these things, but I am all these things. And, yeah. you know, do you, are you hard on yourself? I am, but I, to your point, yeah, like I'm 35. I've You're got, 35? Yeah. You look young. Thanks, man. I thought maybe you were like 26. Ryan, what'd you think? No, I, I read his book. I read the Wikipedia. No, I knew him. My man. See, no. Ryan in his research. Ryan in his wiki. No, research also, Ryan over here. No, but also he walked in and I, look, I looked you in the face and was like, oh, that's someone around my age. Because that rarely happens in here. Like, yeah. Oh, are you, are you, I'm 33. About to th I'm about to turn 34. And you, you look great too, Ryan. Thanks, man. You got grays? We both have dark hair. I got yeah. a lot of grays. Yeah. It's, a, it's the yours. dark hair. No, I mean, I they, they're coming in. I got to cut my head. And then, uh, See, right um, now, I'm looking at both of you and listening to both of you <laughs> and thinking, fuck off. Because <laughs> I'm going to be 50 in a few months. And you have and no I'm, gray hairs, though. Well, I have gray hairs right here. That's it. Right on but my chin. But none on top. Chin. And a great, I mean, great head of lettuce over there. So far? <laughs> Thick hair. Why, you get gray hairs? You're, oh, yeah. You do? Oh, they're do all, you dye it? No. They're you, here. I just, they, I kind of put some gel in, so it helps like tone gel. it. Yeah, I get, what should I say? Pomade? Pomade, sure. I, you know, I just was wondering what, what you used. A cream. That was a cr cr cream. <laughs> Whatever's been mousse. sent to me for free. Like, I feel like the one thing you get as an actor of any sort of, like, you could either be an Oscar winner or, you know, on infomercials. You can probably get free hair products. Yeah, <laughs> so that's true. I'll get, you know, a couple things of gel a year and be like, well, once these are done, I guess I'll go and buy some at Rite Aid. What's the coolest free shit you've gotten? Ooh, I got a car for a couple months. They let me borrow a car. Was this the GM? Was this no, the uh, GM's doing it. Well, I'll, they did. I remember I'll, I'll I had some out. friends that got free cars for a while, and I never was that guy. I never got that. I my When my wife was pregnant, I made, because I was doing a lot of social media and YouTube stuff, so I made this video where I told my friends, like where I would tell them that she was pregnant and catch the reactions. And it's just like this feel-good thing. And it was beautiful because a lot of people saw it and a lot of baby brands were like, need a stroller? And I was like, in fact, I do. Strollers are expensive as hell. So I got the stroller and a few other things. And Acura randomly emailed and was like, need a car for the first couple months with your new kiddo? And I was like, who am I to turn down Acura? Parent company of Honda? I'm wow. in. Acura gave him a free car. But then Hard Body Karate, I hope you're listening, Acura. They like hit us up randomly, like somewhere two and a half months in and was like, we're taking it back tomorrow. I'm like, no planning? No heads up, Acura? Just we want it back. Yeah. We're over you. You didn't post enough. <laughs> Is that what it was? <laughs> Probably. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Hey, do me a favor. Take me back to... Take me back to childhood. Take me back to when you were a kid because, you know, I used to complain. Everybody complains about their parents and it's just like, you know, my dad's this. He's not affectionate. He doesn't say I love you. He doesn't. He's not, you know, he's not really present. My mom's this. She's off the wall. She's this. Everybody complains and everybody's got it. Worse. Some people have it worse and people, there's always people out there that have it worse. And totally. Then I look at your life and I'm like, your father wasn't there. Right. And your mother raised you. And that had to be hard as fuck for a little kid. Yes. Can I say fuck on the podcast? Can you? Can I, Ryan? Ryan? It's your own podcast. Dude. All right, sure. Yeah, Thanks. I say so. Thanks. Yeah, why not? Yeah. But, it, you know, it just, I look at that, and I'm like, right away, I'm like, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like, I feel for you. Like, you didn't have that father figure, and talk to me about that. How, how Was that pretty tough? I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't miss what I had never had. So, I, I talk about this in my book and mm -hmm. it's it's much like we were we were talking about like my biggest issue with life and god and the universe was just how different i was like i didn't have a dad i was fat like i was a musical theater kid I wasn't good at sports single mom like we were just we were so terminally unique at a time where you don't want like you just desperately want to fit in even like, you know, there's no, there's not really Jew heroes when you're eight. Like there was like Sandy Koufax, but that's yeah. before my time. You're like, yeah, we, I know we got Einstein, but it's not really, <laughs> is there a Jew Pokemon? Like, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need a hero. And so. I <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So, yeah, I, but I didn't, 
have a resentment against my dad. I had a resentment of against God. Like I even talk about how my mom and I, she has a fear of flying. So we would constantly take trains or drive, you know, from New York to Florida. And I'm like, of course, because flying would be too normal for the pecs. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And, and then the dad stuff started to sort of rear its ugly head in my teens. And when I was able to finally sort of face it or start cracking that, anger and resentment that I had was actually when I started losing weight. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s and I found out that he had passed away and I had this wave of just sort of, I don't know if it was remorse or regret in having never, never meeting him that I was like, wait, I, I now have to mourn this guy I never met too? So there were many phases to working it out. There's There's a weird, I guess, innate sadness about that, like sort of, you know, fuck him. He yes. wasn't here. Mom's taking care of me. I've got it. I have a career. I'm making money. I'm living my life. And then the guy that never was there dies mm. and it still affects you. Yes. How do I mean, what do you do? How do you deal with that? You know, for the years leading up to that, I was like in my early 20s, I'd gotten sober and I'd lost all this weight. And I was like, my career was so up and down, but like I knew there was enough data to support that. I think things are going to work out in some way. I have no idea how, but I, I've sort of made it. I'm, I'm certainly the weight and height of a full grown man. And I think I might be on my way there. Right. And I was like, if I go find my dad right now, he's 86 and I'm 24 or 25 at the time. And I don't need anything from him. So what do I get? Like he gets this great kid who doesn't need anything. And I don't get the full dad experience. Like I get this geriatric dude. And I was- yeah. And then when I found out he had passed away, and I, I tell this story in the book, he had no online footprint because the dude was almost 90. And so- Your mom liked older dudes. Yeah. Well, my mom's older. She's my, older. My mom was 43 when she had me, and he was like 62. Wow. She did like the older guys, though. Shout out, mom. I say mom. in the book, like my dad was getting like Medicare and chicks pregnant. <laughs> 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 that's that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> right. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I decided, I knew that he had another family, and- my mom had met his other family, like his wife, who he supposedly was had a well-timed separation on the one night that he actually hooked up with my mom and like his kids who were grown because he was an older guy. So a buddy of mine said, why don't we search your, your siblings? You know their name. And all of a sudden on Facebook, like I had never, I'm 26. I'd never even seen a picture of him. And suddenly- You didn't know what he looked like? mm, -mm. I mean, I assumed he looked like a Jewishy Richard Gere. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you were thinking in your head. I was like, this at, is what, what best, dad looks like. Right. right at right. best. And were you right? It. Not bad. Not I'm a sure. bad looking guy. Pretty good looking guy. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Certainly nice. I'll show you a picture of him. I huh. carried him on my phone. You now. do. <laughs> like, because people wonder, they're like, oh, what, you know, they, I always say like, they're, your parents are like these weird genetic roadmaps and all I had was mm -hmm. my mom. So it felt like half of me, I wasn't informed on what to expect. Right. But but anyway, I, I find my siblings and there's all these posts throughout their life of them with their father and at bar mitzvahs and weddings. And then inevitably when he passed away, these beautiful tributes to him. And I just kind of said, you know, majority rules. Like this guy had a family and it would have taken a shitload of courage to be able to tell them what had happened. And they I, didn't know what happened. I'm assuming not. I'm not exactly hiding, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. Otherwise, I imagine my siblings might be like, wait, we have like a brother out there. He's famous. He doesn't suck. He doesn't suck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so, yeah, it weirdly allowed me to forgive him in a weird way. I was like, oh, uh, you weren't like there's more than one part of you. And what I needed you to be for me, you were you were for this other family, and I can't be the arbiter of like the ultimate right or the ultimate good. Yeah. But, and then of course, uh, you know, because you're a dad, right? Mm, to a dog. Exactly. You get it. I get it. Right. Yes, human and dog, very similar. <laughs> very similar. <laughs> so the 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 argument could be made that that the dog is superior, but it wasn't <laughs> until I had my own kid and I had to do it with him, and I was like, oh, like. My dad missed all this. And yeah. so he didn't get off scot-free. He just messed, he messed up. up. Yeah. 
Did you, was there a part of you that, I want him to see my fame. I want him to see that I did all right. I want to see him to see that I made money and that I'm, I'm on my two feet and I could do this and I don't need him. I, maybe, I mean, I, my mom had sent him a picture of me when I was five and just sort of like um, a quick little blurb about where I was at and crushing, you know, blocks or reading. And, and <laughs> crushing like, blocks. Did he respond? He No. And so I was like, oh, he turned down this like fetching five-year-old. <laughs> like, so I just figured he was probably so, I, people always say like, you think he thought about you on like his last couple hours on this earth? And I was like, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I would have been, I would have been like, I hope he did. Yeah. I hope he thought of me. I hope he <laughs> thought about the one thing that he regretted. The one thing that he just wished he would have done differently. And yeah. that was me. Yeah. You know, I get, I think that a lot of people would think that way. But yeah. I mean, but it seems like you got your shit together and you're, you're a little more humble than that. Maybe. It took a lot of work. Again, I'm so damn self-centered that it's almost like I can't even think about the reasons why you know, I am the way I am, or I have the insecurities or trauma or dysfunction. I just am so, so like, I blame myself for everything for better or for worse. Really? Pretty much. Yeah. But I spin out when I do that. And, and then I just go, and then I just get a case of the fuck it. So I have to mitigate that. <laughs> Two tears in a bucket, motherfuck it. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Everybody knows these guys. Everybody loves them. I love them. Ryan. That's great. Yeah. Yep. It's helping you. I'm getting a lot out of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Look, folks, relationships take work, especially the most important one you can have in your life. And that is your relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? It's true. We don't. We're not good to ourselves enough. And you got to be good to yourself and you'll learn how to be good to yourself. But one of those things you could do is join uh, BetterHelp. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does. And therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. Ryan, what would you say BetterHelp is doing for you? Uh, it is helping me to uh, learn about myself better, uh, how to treat myself better. Uh, and, and just talking about things that are bothering me, however big or small. Yeah, because sometimes you think, oh, I have friends to talk to. I have mm -hmm. No, you, you can't be absolutely open with your thoughts and your demons and your thing just with friends or, you know, people think they take it. It's so easy, you know, like, oh, I, I don't need to worry about that. And it builds up and it builds up and it festers and we all implode at some point. <laughs> so we got to take care of ourselves and better help. Online therapy is there to help us. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside that's b-e-t-t-e-r-h-e-l-p dot com slash inside thank you better help couldn't do it without you inside of you is brought to you by ferity ferity brand is unbelievable and let me tell you why this is the company that i actually went out to get i had probably bought five or six shirts and other articles of clothing and I just love how they feel, the softness and the quality of the product. And I and I asked my 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 lovely Agnes, who's uh, who works over at Westwood One. I said, "Can you get Faraday on? I just love Faraday." And guess what? We got Faraday. Everyone's talking about fake spring and how difficult it is to dress around this time, but that's because it is. It can be so difficult to find the right outfit in the spring when every day is different and weather can change at the drop of a hat. Luckily. Faraday makes it way easier. They make the perfect clothes for all seasons, and that is the truth. Faraday is a family-run brand making high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. It's that kind of effortless style you want every time you go digging into your closet. That set, that shirt, that dress that feels like you have had them for years. 
Maybe it's in a gorgeous print and it looks like it might be vintage, but it fits so well that it feels like it was made just yesterday, just for you. Well, that's Verity. Yeah, I love this. And I love how I, I'm not one that always say, hey, touch me. But I'm always like to my friends, I'm like, hey, feel this. Feel You got to feel this Feels quality. Good. Kind of like a little stretch, warmth, comfort. You have to try Faraday. You really do. I want them to stick around as sponsors for one. But really, I love their their product, and I hope you guys do. Faraday is so confident in the quality of their stuff. They have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They will replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. Have you ever heard of that with clothes? Talk yeah. about making it easier to get dressed. And right now, Faraday is giving all my listeners, inside of you listeners, 20% off. 20% off. Head to Faraday. That's F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand, B-R-A-N-D, FaradayBrand.com, and use code inside of you at checkout to snag 20% off all your new spring staples. That's inside of you at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com for 20% off. You were doing stand-up at like eight years old. Is that true? I was. How is that possible? Where are you doing this? I was too fat for T-ball. <laughs> like, did you try to go for T-ball or you just didn't even try for sports? I tried, um, but the asthma and the weight, it just didn't. Asthma, overweight. <laughs> Great. Living with your mom. Your dad has nothing to do with you. I mean, these are these are things that would fuck up almost anybody. For sure, right? Yeah. Man. Yeah, but then I mean, you're you mentioned how like when you were 14 you were feeling insecure and and was that just because you hadn't hit puberty yet? I mean, were you still oh, like yeah. a pretty athletic normal kid? Well, I guess I was athletic, but I remember we were like played basketball. It was Indiana, so people played basketball and oh, yeah. people would do shirts and skins. Ugh. And I would if I was a skin, I'd say, "Guys, you know what? I don't feel well." Because I didn't want to take my shirt off because I had no hair under my arms. And I remember Mike Curry down the street was like Harry and the Hendersons. <laughs> and he would be like, "Rosenbaum, You've got no hair under your arms. You're like 15. What's up? Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, I'm a swimmer. I'm a swimmer. Yeah. Well, uh, they, they, we shave. We shave. So, you know, it's the aerodynamics through the water. So that's what I do. Fair. I'd make up stories. I was <laughs> embarrassed. I was, I mean, I, I remember crying one day because my dad was six foot five. My mother was relatively tall. And my mom was always, you know, she took a lot of Valium and a lot of, pill she was a pill popper and yeah you know, my, my kind of person yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and dad was always you know back in the day not when i was growing up but like smoked a lot of pot when he was in his you know 18 and then he, he he had me when he was 18 or 19 and my mom was 23 wow but i remember crying i remember being in the kitchen and going, if you didn't do so many fucking drugs, I wouldn't be so small. What's wrong with me? You're tall. You're tall. And I, was just, and I went and I just heard them laughing as I left the room. And I was like, God, you're an idiot. But I mean, I just, it's, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> How did Jews make it to Indiana? Uh, Dad got a job transfer. He got a job transfer and uh, it was it was weird. I mean, I never really felt the you know being a jew in indiana that much i think my mom probably felt it uh my dad they sensed it but i was kind of ignorant to that i just mm. sort of like was in my own world my sister experienced some people like, like one guy throwing a quarter down the hallway and saying go fetch it jew sure but you know i didn't yeah terrible but i i didn't i didn't i wasn't privy to that i didn't feel that in my life i had some young cool friends and um I did everything I could to get away from my parents. I would just, I want to stay out with my friends as long as possible, play flashlight tag and, and capture uh, fireflies. Uh, fireflies, is that what they're called? Fireflies. Yeah. And just stay out until I had to come home. Same. I really didn't want to be home. You felt like that? Totally. And it wasn't, it, it was just the reality of like, when you have a mom who's in her fifties and she's exhausted from working and solely taking a kid around all day, like I remember on the weekends, if we did one thing, and we're in New York, right? So it's not like, you know, there weren't kids in my building, and like right. I couldn't just go. Not, I mean, around. I remember around like eleven when I started middle school at sixth grade. I started taking the bus, the the crosstown bus alone, which you know, parent, how old? Twelve. Twelve. So That's that was that was my freedom pass, but. I remember if like my mom and I would do one thing on a Saturday, like go to the mall for two hours and 
eat at the food court. <laughs> like that was it. Like when we got home at two, we were shut down for the night. And I was like, fuck. Like yeah. now it's me and the TV till <laughs> 10. <laughs> I was so lonely. What did, what did she, was she uh, the type of mother? Cause I know you, she's a Jewish mother, but would she talk about your weight? You, you have to lose weight. You have to, or would she just feed you and you need to eat? W which way did it go? Well, she had always, she has always struggled with food and weight. We're just, we come from a family of big people. So yeah. I knew that I saw firsthand that I was like, oh, food is an issue for the packs. Like it's this like menacing force. So at like five, six, seven years old, I would like be sitting playing Game Boy at Weight Watchers meetings that she was at just over to the side or Overeaters Anonymous. But you were just there for her. Yeah, because she had no one to leave me with. Wow. But it certainly informed food was the ultimate focus and food was great or terrible. It was brisket for holidays or popcorn at the movies or let's order Chinese. Or it was, you know, we have to only keep cold cuts in the fridge because otherwise mom will binge. And we have to make sure there's no like fruit by the foot or Dunkaroos around here because right. Josh will lose his shit and black out. <laughs> 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 I'll find him on the floor drooling. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. Did you get made fun of? Oh yeah, viciously. Really? In school at a young age, you remember being called what? Yeah, I remember at the JCC the first time when I was eight years old and a kid called me a fat fuck. And I was a like, fat really? fuck? How old is he? I was like, really at our community center? Like we're supposed to band together, guys. Or were you humiliated? Oh, it was the, I'll tell you, it was the first thing, because obviously I was hip to the fact of like, oh, I'm bigger than my fellows. Like, I. <laughs> <laughs> you have a really good attitude. I mean, you're like, you have this, this sort of feeling. I don't know. You're just ahead of your time that I would be just like a mess. And you're I like, well, you know what? This is why this is happening. <laughs> you have always these thoughts of like, well, I have a reason for this. There's a reason for this. It feels like there's a light bulb that went, you're just a smarter kid than I was. I don't know. I, I think I, I, maybe it's the way I portray it now. Cause then it was, it, and I remember when he said that it was like the first time it wounded. And I was like, oh, like being this way is going to be challenging. Like, yeah. This is going to, and and I think I very soon after I made a decision that like, as an overweight person, true or not, this was what I thought. You walk into a room at a like at a disadvantage. People make a snap judgment about you that you're, you know, slothful. You lack control, and that it it was incumbent on me to win them over. And I think that's what inspired comedy and whatnot. Because I was like, how do I even? I just I don't even want to be thought of as great. I just want to be on an even playing field as everyone else. So you thought if you were doing stand up comedy and you can kind of show them up and kind of say, hey, look, I'm not that guy. I'm funny. I've got I'm creative. I have talent. I have all these things. So don't look at me as the fat guy. Look at me as a creative, funny. Yeah. You know, and what would you make like in your stand up? Would you use your weight as part of the joke? Uh, you know? Yeah. Like I had, you know, and I'm sure they, they probably had it in Indiana Entenmann's. Um, it was like store brands yes, and pastries. Yes. Yes. I don't know if it's big on the West coast, but you know, it's like store brand Danish and donuts and huge on the East coast. And one of my jokes when I was like, 10 years old was I, at school, I major in entomology, the study of entomans. <laughs> coming out of a, a little fat kid's mouth, they were like, oh, this is genius. This is great. So I, sh I surely was like, I'll make fun of myself first so you don't have the chance and in doing so, hopefully win you over. Wow. Mm. And this is something you were telling your mom at a young age, I want to I want to do stand up. Yeah, I mean, she was, my mom is like the ultimate sort of vaudevillian. I mean, she's she's 77, right? So her contemporaries were Mel Brooks and right. Carl Reiner and the true greats of comedy. But she was like the self-made businesswoman, um, a female in the workforce in the 70s and 80s who like had to deal with a lot of male bullshit and dealing with like Wade and just all this stuff, all, all these challenges. So I would watch her take over rooms. Like she was, she was always, very confident, always ready with a joke. Oh, it just like a natural. And performer. she was overweight. Yes. Very overweight. Always. Like you talked about with Weight Watchers. She was very heavy. She would vacillate. Sometimes she would be totally like at a normal weight and it was great. And then she could put on a, a good amount of weight quickly. Right. So it just was it yo yo throughout my whole life. Did she date? Did she date? Did you see other men that came into the picture? Or would... No, never. <laughs> she, what? Oh, she's giving me that movie line. Like when I, you know, when you were born, like that ended for me. She never dated after you. 
not. So you don't think your mom, since she had you at 43, has had sex in 30 something years? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think probably, but it's like, it was probably, she was in such survival mode my whole, whole life. And I was just her, her utter focus that if she did, I'm hoping it was just a, a quick fling and I hope they were nice to her. <laughs> I hope they use the rubber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus, I don't need another one of me out there. My God. Well, how did it all start? Like you started doing comedy. Your mom notices he's got something. He's got a spark. He's funny. Yeah. And then what? what you, you went to an agent. You had. A, how'd you get an agent? I so I was reading. Did you ever when you were starting out as an actor? Did you read Backstage Magazine? Of course, New York. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Not, I was eight or nine years old, and this was before stand up. And I find this guy in the classified Sid Gold at Gold Star of Entertainment. Course, Sid Gold. Still around. Reps Jennifer Lawrence now. No, I'm kidding. No, 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 he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jennifer Leibowitz, though. <laughs> well, that's represents. who Jennifer Lawrence was. <laughs> sure. Exactly. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, so he, I go in and, and I meet him, and, and the ad's like, I represent people of all ages and. And he's a sweet guy. And he says, listen, I can get you placed at maybe Caroline, Stand Up New York. I can get you a little stage time. So if you can put together an act, five minutes of comedy, I will get you stage time. How do you, and, and how old are you? Eight, Not, eight nine? or nine, yeah. But how do you get into a comedy club? Isn't it like alcohol and things like that? What do they want a kid who's eight or nine up there? So I started at afternoon shows. So uh, try doing stand up at two. Yeah, nobody there. Terrible. Terrible. So I do those, but it was like a shtick. <laughs> I just had this vision of you. I just said, so anyway, uh, Entenmann's and uh, okay, nobody. How's the chicken tenders? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The thing about Pokemon is like, you know, <laughs> can't do any crowd work because no right. one has has my references. Um, but yeah, and then as I got better at it and I there was like, oh, there's like this kid comedian who's got this shtick. Like maybe we can we can sandwich him in between real comedians at 11 o'clock at night, they would have to sneak me in so they wouldn't lose their liquor license. Wow. Yeah, like through the back door. Anybody famous that you'd go after that you could recall or that was up that night? I'm trying to, no, I mean, I remember I was on a TV show with with a young before half-baked Chappelle. Really? And I was like, I'm a comedian too. He's like, okay. What was that? All. It was, the, the TV show was called Fox After Breakfast. Fox After Breakfast. Tom Bergeron. Really? Was and Chappelle host. was on that. Yeah. And how old were you? I was 11. I'll show you the picture. It's great. Oh, I have to see it. And it, and Chappelle was there. He Chappelle couldn't have been older than 24. Do you remember him being very funny? Were you like, this guy's really funny? Yeah. I mean, I think at that time I was like, oh, this guy will get to my level eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you were cocky. Yeah. I mean, I was just like, it, the beauty of that age where- as soon as you're good at something, and especially like, it wasn't being good at athletics at that age where you're probably good amongst a lot of good kids. I was such an outlier, like a good comedian, at a, you know, a good 11 year old comedian was so rare. So I certainly felt like, oh, I've got this little superpower, this little thing. And your mom saw it too. Did she see it as a, as a way, like, you know, you know, those moms yeah. that like, oh, I, this is a vehicle. This, he could make some money for me and for him. And this could be <laughs> great for the both of us. And, or was she just like, do what you want to do. Was she always do what you want to do? Yes. Or was she like, do this? She was pretty, she was pretty incredible about it. I have to be honest. Like I just, you know, we, we were so up and down financially. And you shared a room in your apartment. You lived in, you had a one bedroom and that you shared with your mother. Yeah, so like we we literally went from sharing a studio where we would switch off on like a Murphy bed and the couch. Mm. And then we got a one bedroom and basically the living room turned into her room and I had the bedroom. And then we lived in a different one bedroom and we switched that. She's like, enough already. Like I, I, I require a bedroom. And I was like, it's fine. I'll be, I'll be fine here near the terrace. Um, and then- yeah, and then I remember I was 12 years old and I was starting to like make, you know, I was just starting to, I did the Conan O'Brien show and Rosie O'Donnell and I'm like, oh, maybe this could work out for me. And we went broke again. And I talk about it in the book, like the book, I don't know when the veil of adolescence falls and all of a sudden you're like, oh, like life is unjust, like life is unfair. This sucks. You started to feel that. Yeah, I, it was a really rough summer of like 1998. And I just was like, I need to do something about this. Not pushed or prompted by my mom, but more so like, I don't want to be this powerless. 
and at the whim of my mom's career because it's too up and down. She's doing her best, but I just don't want to feel this way anymore. And I think I saw that that was an inflection point where I really doubled down on on acting. Really? And stand up, yeah. And so what was the first thing that you remember going, oh, thank God, this is going to bring some money on the, you know, back home? Well, I had a Jew, I had, you know, Jewish grandparents and, and, um, aunts and uncles who were all like, this is cute, but you know, this is a hobby, right? This is no way to live what you're doing. Really? They thought that about acting in general. Yeah. They were like, you'll do this until you go to law school. Right. And I was like, <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> it's probably not. <laughs> Who's paying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I remember that summer and it was really tough. And my mom looked at me and you know, I was going to go from my elementary school to middle school in my district, but we didn't have a district anymore because we had to move in the middle of the night. And she was like, you know, there's that performing arts high school on the west side near Times Square. You should audition for that. Like, I think you would, I think you'd, you'd love it. And I went there 10 days later. I'm. What'd you have to do? Give a monologue? No, I did. I did five minutes of stand up <laughs> for the vice principal. Wow. Shout out Miss Bruno. Miss Bruno. You know, she had the eye. She had the eye of the tiger, <laughs> the eye of the of the talent. <laughs> of the, the baby talent. Yeah, the baby talent. But I walk into that school and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by these kids who are on Broadway and they're on TV shows and they're making grown up money. I was like, that girl has a car. I was like, like she's 16 and she has like a car in New York. That's impossible. No one has a car in New York. So you didn't feel like you fit in really, did you? Well, what I felt was like, oh, maybe my aunts and uncles and grandparents are wrong. Maybe you can do this and make grown up money. Oh. So it was a bit like, it basically at every turn, whether it was that moment or when I got my first TV show, it, it was a level up. It was like, oh, I'm gonna really have to dedicate myself to this now if I wanna operate at these kids level. And- You were intimidated? Or you were just like, I, I'm not intimidated, I'm ready to fucking get there. Oh yeah, I did. I think I did more extracurriculars that year because, like, I'm in this fun house for weird musical theater kids. So now. you got like, in. You got into the performing arts school. Oh my god, I'm <laughs> in, and I'm doing. I was like in choir, in dance, in vocal, in in drama classes. Everything. Oh, I just was like, you let's were never go. home. You were always at school. It's the best. I was the after school kid. Like <laughs> before this, my mom would drop me off at the YMCA and. Um, or she dropped me off at school. Then we'd go to the YMCA till six. So I was out of the house from eight to six Man, every day. And you loved it. I was heaven. I was like, who, another round to kick the can, anyone? <laughs> Brothers really? and sisters. And how old are you, nine, 10? <laughs> oh yeah, that was, yeah. And it worked for her because she had to work. Right. You know, I mean, I have a kiddo now who's three and like I have a wife and I've got a lot of support and I'm still like, ah, that's not enough time in the day. Right? Yeah. Oh my God. So it's you, a lot. So- so you're going to this performing arts school. You've got this agent, Sid Gold. God bless him. I'd moved on. Sorry, You'd moved Sid. on already from Sid. What can I say? I mean, you were only with Sid for a, for a year, maybe. Maybe. And you moved on. Was he very upset? I think he's, he's my, a buddy of mine the other day was like, I, I, I was rep by Sid Gold too. He got me like a TV show. I was like, oh, I should have st stuck around Everybody a Everybody fucking leaves Sid Gold. What is that? And he's still going. And these people leave him. They come into his life. He helps them. <laughs> And then they just let go of them. <laughs> Who do you know that remember the name of your first agent? Oof. Or, or or the was, company? There, there was one, um, Arthur. <laughs> Arthur something. But I remember I told him that I'm gonna go with this other agency. Ooh. And I remember I called him and I said, Hey, God, what was his fucking name? And I just remember him going, he, first he goes, Hello. <laughs> I go, hey, it's Michael. Rosemary goes, Michael, how you doing? And I'm like, good. Listen, I just wanted to talk to you. Um, you know, I there's this, uh, you know, this other agent that's pursuing me, and they've got this commercial department. He goes, go for it, fuck off. <laughs> that was it. Um, how healthy? Just was like, fuck you. Was he in a, a, a one man shop? Like he was kind of a one man shop. He was like, fuck you, go do whatever you want. He was so insulted that I would consider another agent. Of course, it wasn't maybe as blunt, but it was pretty like hang up the phone and I, I remember going wow yeah i guess uh that wasn't right for me i wonder if sid gold got pissed off when you left and was like fuck you josh <laughs> piece that, of shit i was getting 40 dollars a night at caroline so I and he know. was getting a percentage of that four bucks 
He was really getting you would send him money. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want your four bucks, kid. <laughs> I want that. Uh, the, was it an Acura? What did you get? The car, the free car Acura, nice. later on? MDX, the, the full size sedan. Really? Or SUV, SUV. Jesus, so lucky. I mean, and technology package. Nice nav. <laughs> nice navigating <laughs> system. Inside of you is brought to you by Patreon. That's right. Patreon. Listen, guys. Patreon helps the podcast survive. It's people over there, my patrons, who give back to the podcast a little bit more. And there's so many friendships that have spawned from this and relationships, people on Patreon that support the podcast. And uh, I really appreciate it. But it's built an incredible community. Uh, if you want to get early access to episode content... Check out the Patreon. If you want to interact with fans of the show, check out the Patreon. If you want to get exclusive access to have your questions asked during the show, uh, check out the Patreon. I mean, Ryan Heck, if you just love what we do and you want to keep this train rolling, check out that Patreon. Uh, it doesn't take much to get involved. And I'm there all the time. I'm chatting with folks and uh, putting together live hangouts. Um, I literally could not do this, like I said, without my patrons. So to get more involved in the community, Today, head over to patreon.com slash inside of you. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash inside of you. And I will message you right after you join. And I am excited to see your name. Uh, patreon.com slash inside of you. And I will see you there soon. So your mother at this point, and you're taking all these classes and extracurricular, she's seeing something. She's like seeing this love, this passion for it. Yes. And she knew, she you don't know then that, you know, you're going somewhere. You know, when I eventually, a year later, got offered this TV show in California, and basically I had to leave my whole life to go do that. What and was that? It was called The Amanda Show with Amanda, Amanda Bynes. Amanda, how is she to work with? She's the, the greatest. Was she really the greatest? Again, much like going to this performing arts high school, I show up and it's a sketch comedy show, and she's a, she's like the Carol Burnett. And, I, and of course they ice me right away, which I don't blame them for, but I had been sort of put, I had been highly suggested that I get this job from the president of Nickelodeon who had met me a year before and was like, you got something, you're funny. And as you know, producers love being told what to do. Right. And they were like, okay. And they took me, but they didn't know. So I was relegated to waiter number three <laughs> in sketches. Oh boy. But instead of being resentful, I was like- Embraced it. Yeah, and I just watched her because I'm like, we're six months apart in age, but you are like decades ahead of me in ability. And I just sort of studied her instead of being pissed I was on the bench. Did she like you? I think or did she not really was aware of you? She wasn't aware of you. As much as like, I don't- Oh, well, you were the third waiter, the, the server. Yeah, I remember yeah. you. You, had, you have something. Yeah, you like the snack table. <laughs> you, like the, you still like the snack table at that point? Oh, that's when I really started doing damage. I'm like, this is free? <laughs> that, this is this is good we get free food you know as much food as you want get, and no one ever complained about your weight like any producers or directors or they just embrace it like yeah let him be the uh overweight kid oh they loved it i mean i was especially in the early 2000s like i was fulfilling a, a niche like a thing especially in like ya or kids tv there was always the fat friend or the fat bully and like that was a, a big part that was sort of my inspiration or, or motivation to lose weight was like, if I really want to act, I'm being relegated and stereotyped into these like two parts. And it doesn't seem like they're writing parts for people like me. That's anything more than this. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's obviously so much better now. And I don't mean, I think some people might read my book and think I speak hyperbolically about myself or, or I'm taking the piss out of myself too much, but it was, it was truly a different world. Right for a guy who looked like me at that time. Right, and this kind of led you into, when you did Drake and Josh, it was sort of the same thing? Well, yeah, Drake was, so Amanda was on All That, which was like All that, SNL right, for kids. Right. She got Amanda show, Drake and I were on Amanda show, and we got our own show a year later. They liked you guys that much that you just blossomed on the show. Yeah. And you got your own show. Yeah, they called the guy who created All That and Amanda show, this guy Dan Schneider, and they were like, do you have another, like, buddy comedy idea because he had made keenan and kel and he said nope <laughs> they were like great well if, if you have an idea let us know and drake and i are doing a scene towards the, the last episode of the season and this guy steve malaro who's now you know huge writer and, and producer for chuck Lorre, he goes over to dan and goes um don't they want you to write a buddy comedy and he said yeah he's like it's those two idiots <laughs> like 
those two. Really? He's like, that's your, bu- those are your buddies. And six months later, we were on the set of Drake and Josh. Were you, were you shocked that you're getting your own show? Seemed like that's how it worked. Like, oh, this is how Hollywood works. Like you do good on one show and then you get your own show, at least for kids TV. And your mom is in LA with you because you moved with her from New York to LA. Yeah. She's there to support you. We've got a two bedroom apartment at the Avalon. I'm talking amenities, like a racquetball court. Um, What a treat. Carpet. Carpet. Nice carpet, a fridge with the ice dispenser. Like we could not, we were literally- You were happy. We could not believe- how good our life was. And how close were you with Drake at that point? Very, very tight, very good friends? No, we never, we, I think what was always, we were naturally just kind of like, we had a brotherly type thing where it was either we were close or, or we were really not. But what we could appreciate about each other, I think was like, there's some magic here. Like something works between us. I remember not to like compare to, true geniuses but don rickles has this great quote about him and um um oh my god i'm blank. Val kilmer no his no. <laughs> <laughs> his partner bob newhart oh newhart well, of course and he always said here i was this jew from queens and is that is a ice cream no it's here? a it's i never turn it off it's the cuckoo clock <laughs> cute yeah so if you hear the cuckoo clock it means it's a really good episode love it everyone yeah. It's noon. Yes. No, is it? <laughs> it it's, uh, it's, it's almost noon. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, you have a cuckoo clock for like 11.50. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's off. It's, <laughs> it's off. It's off. I, I, it really is. It doesn't work right. It's just it goes off whenever it wants to. That's even more fun. Yeah, but I need to turn it off. <laughs> but go ahead, Newhart. So, it, and uh, Rickles has this great quote about him and Newhart where he's like, here I was, this like, you know, Jewish kid from Queens, and he was this, you know, Catholic guy from the Midwest came from totally different backgrounds, but something about us together worked. And like Drake's a, you know, some kind of Christian from Orange County and I'm this chubby Jew kid from New York, but like somehow when we got together, it it worked. It worked. It worked. But you didn't necessarily get along or liked each other or hung out. It just worked. It just worked. But did you go home and say, mom, I just really don't like Drake. (laughs) Sometimes. He's just a real asshole. He's so mean. (laughs) I don't know. No, I, sometimes. I mean, and I'm sure you said the uh, some version of that. that about, annoying Josh Peck. <laughs> can't stand right. him. Always eating all the snacks. Right. It's like enough already. Oh, I have some self-control. <laughs> some control. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. But it was, yeah. And it, it, you know, we made, people I think think we did a lot more of it, but we only made 60 episodes over like five years. But What were they paying you then? Oh, I want to know so this. Fun. I'm I'm curious. To, I it's not much, is it? So I think at the height of it, we made ten thousand an episode, or at the fif- height, fifteen. I I, I when I, it became kind of, I guess it lasted sixty episodes. How many seasons is that? Four. Four seasons. So by the yeah. fourth season, you're making 10, 15 grand an episode. I think like the median I say in the book is like when all was said and done. I think we it averages to about fifteen thousand an episode. And I, I only, because it's gross to talk about money, except for, I think the misconception is like, if you are on a that's show- what, Yeah, that's what I want to talk about, because I think people assume please. you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars. You're on a show, you've made it. And that kind of money, as much as it sounds, in the $15,000 an episode, does sound like a lot of money to right. most people. But- you take the taxes, you're in a tax bracket, you take all the agents and the managers and the commissions, and you're left with about six, and you're living- Yes. You're living. You have to live. You have to pay for your apartment. So at the end of the, what, you, you like 4000 Yeah. That, that money goes by quickly. That's why you think, how did this guy get broke? Right. He was on the show for four years. Because he really wasn't making that much. In LA, to live in LA is is very expensive. Yeah. So I always, I'm always curious. I'm always curious, like, how much did they make on, a, on like a, a kid show like that? You know, but. And yeah. no residuals. No residuals. I love telling people that. I don't know. That's I, bullshit. I think I'm like one of those weirdos who likes to tell people like someone's passed away. Like, you know, Fran passed. John died. Yeah. Like, oh, I didn't ask you that. Yeah, I know. I know, but you should know. Yeah, and <laughs> Fran. They died together. <laughs> I love telling people about no residuals in kids' TV because they all have your reaction. They're right. like, how, how, how? 
Yeah. People always think it's like, oh, Hulu just b- bought Smallville. You must be making <laughs> millions. I don't think I've gotten one check. Really? Not nothing. It's, it's streaming. They haven't out. figured streaming out yet. I don't I don't think so. Dude, streaming is so, and I, I got to give respect to like Netflix and every gigantic streamer. It's the most beautifully gangster move of like a oh, corporation. Yeah. We don't understand it. <laughs> we don't know what to pay you. We don't know. This is just. Yeah. And, we, you, and we're not going to tell you whether you're doing good or not because that gives you leverage. <laughs> What do you get into in your book briefly about uh, Drake and Josh? Do you get into the dark stuff at all? What do you mean? Was there any dark stuff while you're filming that? Was there anything that you remember that just, you know, uh, you saw some things that you, as a kid, you probably shouldn't be privy to? I mean, I, what I really talk about, uh, Drake and I specifically, and it's really just like the way in which people marry themselves to you when they fall in love, like the people fall in love with the first image they have of you. And it really sets the tone for the way they're going to think about you forever. Like Steve Carell's the man, one of our greatest actors, most people will think of him as Michael Scott forever, for mm-hmm. better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Cause they, that show is so beloved. Right. And so with Drake and I, like I said, what meant the most to me was what this show meant to other people. And because it was in reruns for free, forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i'll still at 35 having not shot an episode of that for almost 20 years have new kids and families come up to me and talk about how much they love it and it's a testament to the show that it sort of had that lasting power but so no one to me had to ever know that drake and i weren't exactly close right um, you don't talk to him anymore right, at all right i don't but right. i got married a few years ago and I didn't invite him because we're not close. And, and he didn't like that. No, and he took to the internet and basically like, I think he wrote an innocuous shitty tweet that then caught fire and he leaned in completely when he saw how outraged people were. Cause they're like, no, you guys were just sharing a room last week. I'm like that was 11 years ago. <laughs> like, Jesus. And I was like- So they got down on you. Oh, crushing. For a really long time. Since then, people, I think, have actually, you know. That's hurtful. That's um, like, I didn't invite you because we never were really friends. And people don't know that. And it's been 12 years. We don't talk. My wife's Irish. She's got a big family. Yeah. <laughs> I have friends I see once a month and I didn't invite them. Of course. But you know that. Because and I'm... I know that. But like, you know, the Twitter mob did not understand that. Yeah. And mostly I was just outraged because I was like. My wife's a private person. She's not an actor. And she's supposed to be in the afterglow of like this very special event. And she's being shit on by 12 year olds who are like calling her Yoko. <laughs> oh like, boy, she oh, broke up the voice. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Did so, you ever tweet out and say, fuck you? I didn't because I, I had some really great counsel in that moment, moments where I was like ripping my hair out, where I'm like, why am I the most famous I've ever been for the worst thing ever right in this moment? Right. Like TMZ never gave a shit about me, but somehow they want to talk to me right now. And my friends were like, well, what would you say? And I, I much like I just said, I was like, I'd tell the truth. They're like, so you're the bearer of bad news. Like you're going to be telling the world that you guys were never close. They're like, you can't, you won't win. You're right. Wow. I never thought about that. Yeah. He was right, wasn't he? Yeah. They were like, just shut up. And they're like, reasonable, pe- reasonable people will know it. And even people who are outraged now over time will be like, uh, actually, that kind of seems Jeez. whack. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think about that. But wow. It's like <laughs> people's perception of like, you know, when I was on a show, they, 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 they don't want to know that we were actually arch enemies, <laughs> you know, that, really? you know, they don't want, they don't yeah. want to know that they want to think that we, you know, like maybe we were, I don't know. I don't know what people think, but I, I think they like that we're friends. We are friends. We become stronger friends. The opposite of you guys. Really? Yeah. We've become stronger friends as the years go on. Um, we're doing a couple of projects together and that's awesome. But you know, but that's not for everybody. There's a lot of people I've worked with that I, I wouldn't invite to my wet fucking wedding. Would you say it's more, I mean, you've worked so much and done so many cool things of all different types and huge things and indie stuff. Like and shitty things. Same here. We've all done shitty. Things. Um, but nice house, right? Sometimes yeah, hey, the I'm shitty things grateful, pay for the house. Very grateful. I'm doing something cool next month. Pay nothing. Beautiful. Look <laughs> yeah. at these beautiful shore mics that we're using. Gorgeous. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> Joe Rogan approved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but would you say like, I find like that's the rare occurrence. Like I've maybe collected in 20 years, two or three people from projects from like, 
I love them. They're a big part of my life. Yes. Everyone else, nice. I, I, that's the same with me. Yes. Right. There's, there's a couple of people that I'll talk to here and there and I like talking to, but you know, I don't talk to them constantly. Right. And it's nice to catch up. Like for instance, Kristen Krook, who's uh, Lana Lang on Smallville. Sure. She and I were friends. Mm. I consider her a friend, but how often do I see her? Maybe at a convention <laughs> signing an autograph or, you know, I ask her to do my podcast and she's very sweet and she'll, you know, uh, she'll do it. Mm. Um, she asked me to do something, I would do it. If she needed a favor, I would do it. But we don't see each other all the time. But yeah. we're, you know, I consider her my friend. Yes. But, um, you know, there comes, there's most of the people that you work with are just like, whether you like them or you don't like them, it's just, it, it's work. Yes. It's work and you, you work with them enough and you really, there's nothing else or you don't have anything in common or there's just, you have the different lives. It's camp. It's camp. camp and people don't, people don't understand that. But yeah. when did you uh, decide and why did you decide to lose all the weight? And this is, again, this is in the book. Yes. This is all in the book. Yes. Happy people are annoying. Happy <laughs> people are annoying, which you guys, I, I can't, I can't wait to read it now. I'm so glad that we got to talk because I find this really interesting. This story is something that a lot of people don't know about this world yes. and growing up with a, a single mom and not having the father and you know finding a spark finding something you like with stand up and then you know it, it takes you out to LA and you somehow get your own show after being the the third waiter on the left on the Amanda Bynes show and it's just this build up in the story that I think would make a great movie if yeah. you can, that condensed it so I urge you guys to check that out but um thank you so when when did that time come where you like did someone tell you you need to lose weight? Did you think like, I want to lose weight. I want to look different. What was it? I think there, you know, I was 17 years old and on yet another road trip with my mom. And I, I, there was, it was sort of this perfect storm, which was I'd been incredibly insecure. And in many ways, what I find my, my saving grace now when people are like, oh, you're pretty normal for an actor at 35. And I'm like, well, at the moments in where my ego could have completely got out of control, I was a hundred pounds overweight. So constantly I was like, don't get too hyped about yourself. Look at you. And wow. so every time I could have gone to a party or a club or something cliche, I just was like, I'll just stay home and alphabetize my DVD. It's like, that's sad. Yeah. That's sad. It really is. It's, it's a shame. <laughs> it was, I, I, it is. And I, I just knew it. There was this moment at 17 where I was like, I miss some stuff, like some pivotal things I can already tell. And, and you've also probably saved yourself in a lot of ways because you could have gotten into some deep trouble. You know, yeah. you start going out with all these kids and partying and you see what happens. No offense, but like you see what happens to some of the people you've worked with and totally. then shit happens. And so maybe not being around that saved you in many ways. Yeah. I mean, that would come for me a year and a half later. <laughs> but I, <laughs> right. But I, uh, but what was a real turning point was when I was 16, I did a movie called Mean Creek. Right. And it won Sundance and, I was playing a, a overweight bully, but it was the first time that I was playing a real person. And what you come to learn in the movie is that he was this beautifully tragic character who was deeply insecure and, and had learning disabilities and really just desperately wanted friends. And, and it's this beautiful sort of executed movie. And the response was unreal. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm truly... You know, people would always sort of, there was always always a caveat to if someone gave you a compliment about Drake and Josh or something, because they'd, they'd say, oh, but that's just you. I mean, it's literally your name. Right. But this was like, oh, you're- Your character. You're doing something This is here. something, right. So I was like, and Judd Apatow wasn't around then, like guys who were giving non-traditional leading men great parts. So I'm like, I can't wait another 10 years for this. Like another part like this isn't coming around for a really long time. And if I want to be able to really be the kind of actor I want to be, I, I need to be able to transform. And I can't do that at this size. You're 17 years old. And this is what you've come up with. You've, all these things have gone through your mind. Yeah. And you realize I've got to make some changes in my life. Yeah. I want to do this. I want to be seriously taken. I want, and, and I, I want to do other work and I, I, I want to stay in this business. Yeah. And so you made the decision on your own to lose all this weight. I was so sick and tired. I, I remember distinctly saying, if I can be a movie star at 300 pounds or normal and go do a nine to five job, I'd rather be at a healthy weight and do that Yeah, and give it all up. 
So that was like, and I always say, you know, everybody wants a hack or a secret, especially when it comes to losing weight. Cause I feel like no matter who you are, you're contending some in some way with food. And I say, you know, I, what I can tell you is if you're truly sick and tired, it's a great place to start. Cause I never learned anything on a good day. Like pain is the great motivator of my life. Unfortunately, you got to get pretty low to finally be like, I can't take this anymore. How hard was it to lose all that weight? I mean, I think I was like the first 10 year old on Atkins. So <laughs> I had tried for years right. and I would just, you know, I'd lose five pounds in two days and then put it right back on. Cause like it was not sustainable. Right. So those, I remember I was, I went back home to New York for the summer for two months and I just walked the city cause it was like the only thing that didn't hurt. And I would eat better. And if I screwed up and had Mr. Softy one day, because it's a summer in New York, I wouldn't let it ruin the whole week. I would just say, just live to fight another day tomorrow. And suddenly, and I would plateau, but I mean, and and I'm vain. So you go from 300 pounds to 260 in a summer, two months, people start really going like, wow. And then, you know, you drop the next 40 and the next 40 and suddenly they're like, who knew? Like, there was like a- Was an, it exciting? Oh yeah. Did you like the transformation? Was it all just like, as hard as it was, did it feel like this is working? This is, people are seeing me differently. Oh yeah. Uh, dude, I remember I went to the, I would go to the mall. Once I got under 200 pounds, I would go to the mall and go to all the stores I dreamed of wearing their clothes, like oh. Express. <laughs> and Bugap. Express has men's clothing? Yeah. I didn't know that. At a, a great rate, reasonable. Shout out Express. <laughs> I think I knew that. I was thinking United Colors of Benetton. Another good one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I would go to Mervyn's and Bloomington Coat Factory. No. <laughs> but Again, I would... I'm seeing this in the movie. I'm seeing the scene where you go to all these stores and look in there and you're just happy and you're like, you know, and your yeah. friend comes up to you, hey, I'm getting some ice cream. You want some? He's like, no, I'll have a Diet Coke <laughs> right. or something. And, you know, it's just like, I, it's so visual, but it's so, it is, it's got to be an exciting time in your life that you're like, you're like, hey, I'm disciplined. Yes. I'm, I'm doing this and it's working. Yeah, I thought that I had just made it like right before the buzzer. Like you did it. Like you're going to have the, the chance at living life as a thin person. And you, because that was what I've always resisted being defined by, by like, that's what I hate. You know, I, I, I don't hate it. It is what it is now. But like, I hated being the kid actor, the child actor, because I knew that that triggered in people's brains, like for every Zendaya or 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 Jodie Foster. There were a thousand other kids that just you know completely nosedived in front of the public, and so I'm like, I don't want to be in that class. I just want to be an actor. I don't want to be the fat, funny guy. I just want to be an actor amongst actors. Right. Um, but yeah, that was that was huge. When I lost the weight, it was it was a game changer. But unfortunately, I was the same head in a new body, and. Pretty quickly, I got to my goal weight and then became viciously addicted to drugs and alcohol, which really? took over the next four years of my life. And how did your mom respond to that? Was she heartbroken? She was like, you always overdo it. <laughs> like, she, so she knew you were doing these drugs? Oh, yeah. And she didn't. Re she, she wasn't a, a angry or upset? Or? Oh, yeah. She was heartbroken. Terrified. She was? Yeah, every day for four years. I don't think she slept. What kind of drugs did you do? I did them all. Cocaine? Oh, yeah. Heroin? I, no. Okay, but, well, that's good because that could have been the end of it if you got the, went there. I did. I, you know, I mostly, it, it was a lot of, you know, cocaine and, and pills and pretty much whatever How you old? had. Uh, right when I turned 18. 18. So yeah. you finally get this new lust for life. You're thinner. You, you want to be this actor. You're excited. You love the way people are looking at you differently. Mm hmm and you fucking throw it into the fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> you just throw the whole thing down the drain and by doing all these drugs and shit. You just get you're hanging out with the wrong crowd. Yeah, well those kids like the ones who are going to the clubs. I was like, "Oh, oh. take me. I've been, you know, my DVDs are alpha." Are you getting late at this time? <clears throat> no, I mean, I wound up doing cocaine for the first time because of a girl cuz she was the first girl who had ever shown me any attention. And I remember her pulling it out and I'm at this Well, well, what? Not it. Oh, oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the pulling the cocaine. But maybe out. you know, I don't know. We never got that far. <laughs> you never got that far. I'll be honest. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I, <laughs> Jeez. The the book gets really weird around page one twenty. I'm sure it does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but no, I I was at this party and like I think I'd smoked pot, but 
that was the extent of it. And I just remember her, you know, doing cocaine with like her girlfriends and I'm seeing it there. And I'm like, oh, this is like Pulp Fiction. <laughs> this is like the movies. <laughs> like, this is what movie stars do, man. Totally. You kind of feel that. You're like, oh, I'm in Hollywood and I'm doing drugs and this is what I need to be doing. Not even that far. It was, this is what kids do. Like, this is what typical. Oh. I've been working towards typical my whole life. And my whole adolescence was besieged by, you have to- Mind your P's and Q's. Don't say anything out of turn. Do you want another take, boss? Like, I'm not those other child actors. Like, I know my lines and I'm on my mark. Like, right. like louder, faster. Like, am I okay? Will this casting director give me a part? I just want you to think I'm okay. I was in this crazy people-pleasing, you know, storm my whole life. And suddenly I'm like now looking like a normal kid and a normal teen. And I'm like, oh, they do drugs and that's normal. And they go to house parties and they go to clubs and they show up late to places and they're unreliable and that's normal. And I, I died to be normal. And I remember the first, when I finally said yes, I had no conception, conception that this drug would make me feel any different, that it was extreme. All I thought was, A, I hope she's watching and oh good, I'm normal. Isn't that, isn't that fucked? <laughs> it's it is, fucked huh? to think that that's normal like hey i need to be doing this because this is what kids do right this is what everybody's doing yeah it's 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 crazy i'm on party of five right now <laughs> like i'm right i'm all those 90s movies right what now. was the you know and we're almost done here because i could talk i could talk to you for a long time no but, no worries but this is uh what was the did you make the conscious effort to sort of stop doing the drugs did you was there a low point where you hit so low that you're like what am i doing Oh, yeah. What was that moment? Do you remember the moment or moments? It was a culmination. And especially like in recovery, you hear so many like, you know, um, what's it called? Like white light, you know, utter moments of defeat that are so cinematic. You're like, I wish that was me. But it, for me, it was sort of this, I was ruining my relationships. I was quickly becoming just like unreliable and... It was just getting around quickly, like Peck's going through something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider him. Um, right. Ruin relationships with like people that really could have changed my life. Um, some run, some running away from the police. Really? Yeah, I had the proclivity for calling the police on myself because I thought there was some like incentive for being the first to notify them. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't. There's not. The they're still pissed. Yeah, they're still yeah. like, well, we got to do our job, but thanks for giving yeah, thanks us Thanks for calling us, you fucking idiot. Who Aww. is this Who is this kid now? I'm like, wow, Beverly Hills PD, like you, you, you have quick response. <laughs> <laughs> nice response time. <laughs> quick response. <laughs> um, and then, and I just broke my mom's heart on a daily basis, which is corny, but true. But I, I talk about this in the book, like, as I said before, all I wanted to be was a real actor, not a kid actor, not the funny fat guy. And I get this part in this movie called The Wackness, which was about 1994 hip hop in New York. And I was 20 years old and I'm acting against Sir Ben Kingsley, my favorite actor. Right. Wow. And I was like, and I knew I was, I was like, I know nine times out of 10, I'm like, give it to Jonah Hill. <laughs> I'm like, he'll do a better job. Or like, are you sure Miles Teller is not available? Because I'm pretty sure he'd crush this. Wow. But this story, this guy was like, a, a New York hip hop kid, a Jewish kid from New York who loves hip hop. I know how to do this. So the movie goes to Sundance and I'm literally, and I dreamed of this when I was doing Mean Creek. I dreamed, I'm like, one day I'm going to be back here as a star of a movie. and I'm going to look the way I want to look. And there I was, and I was 21 and we do this screening and fucking Tarantino's there. And I'm like, this is it. I've been invited to the table. I'm eating like I am here. And I just remember the next morning, I my eyes start open and I go, I'm getting out of here. And I I booked a flight. And everyone's like, you nuts? You you have a well received movie. It's Sundance, this doesn't happen. Like, and I I just as soon as I'd finally arrived at this finish line I dreamed of, I was like, Oh, I'd never want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. Like this is the Groucho Marx quote. Like it just doesn't, it didn't compute. And what was really rough was I had this realization, which was, oh no, you're bottomless. Like you tried to fill this with food, then drugs and alcohol, and now like prestige and none of it. Nothing's going to fill the void. None of it. And I got sober two weeks later. 
Two weeks later. Yeah. Well, I had to make sure I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I could drink this thought away. <laughs> wow. And how do you feel now? Oh, man, I'm so overpaid. I'm here with you. I yeah. Got a, got a kid, a wife. I'm working. You know, I've been able to keep my shit together for a good good amount of time. I'm I'm lucky. Did you ever think you could be this happy? No. Oh, no way. I didn't think, I just didn't think that I would ever, you know, a good life as a result of good living. Like my life mimics that of like a good man, but I'm not a good man. I mean, maybe, but like at my heart, like I want to set fire to the city. Like deep right. down, I just want, like I say this at the end of the book. And the reason why I wrote, wrote it at 35 instead of maybe 55, or maybe I'd have some cooler stories was like, I just want to, like, I want to give you a perspective of the halfway point, you know? And I just said, like, despite the fact that I work now and, and my life is so great, like, when shit hits a fan, like, I think about getting a bunch of drugs and White Castle hamburgers and just seeing what happens, Jesus. you know? Like, that's always going to be in my head to right. some extent. But I've done the right thing over and over enough to where it's like working out. It doesn't hurt as bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it even feels really good. You've, you, you know, you could always say you've, you've done it. Yeah. I did that. And where did that get me, the drugs? Right. Where did all that, how did I feel? And how did I feel about eating, stuffing my face and eating and being overweight? How did that make me feel? Yeah. And you start to say, what makes me feel good? Why don't I do things that make me feel good? And I think we all do things that we punish ourselves. Yeah. I think that has a lot to do with it. I think I've punished myself in the past with, you know, maybe drinking too much or drugs or, you know, or just other things and ultimately you have to like we said in the beginning you have to be good to yourself you have to be like hey this is this is the life that i've been given i'm lucky i'm here yes what can i do to help other people what can i do to be a better person a better man a better and it's hard to do that yeah but i think that it's it, when you start doing the right things you feel so much better it's did, so obvious. Did you have moments when you really started hitting as an actor, like those moments of cliché-dom where you were like, oh, like do you look like back I, now and yes. give you the shivers? Not only that, but it's almost like I remember those moments where I feel like there's a camera on me <laughs> as I'm doing whatever I'm doing. Yeah. Like this is what I'm, like you said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. I'm supposed to be doing drugs at this huge A-lister's house with other A-listers. And I'm supposed to be, you know, parting with you know, the producers on this movie. And I'm supposed to be, you're not supposed to be doing any of that. Right. You're not supposed to be doing, you know, it's it, it's just, what you, it's this idea, this idea that we have of what Hollywood is and how we could fit in. And, you know, the, as long as I've been here and I, you know, I'm almost 50, it's just like, uh, it means nothing. Someone said, what was it? Alan Richin says, once I got famous or I became whatever, I still realize there's just, there's still nothing here. That's not the answer. Of being famous, right. of being rich, that's not the answer to our lives. Yeah. It's meaning, it's relationships, it's connections. It's what you talk about in your book, right? Yes. And, um, you know, hopefully being content, like we said, you know, being content, going, hey, you know, I'm, I'm all right. I'm good enough. I don't need this other shit so other people like me more, so that, uh, you know, I feel like I fit in. Mm. Um, but I, I, you've been through it. And you've been through so much, and I just I, I really appreciate your candor and your your just your generosity for being so open about all your shit. Well, you know, it's it is the weird, it's the virtuous side of this thing, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, you and I are of a similar generation when it comes to show business, where like I feel like we were of the last class of people where social media wasn't a thing, and where celebrity was still like mysterious, right? Like the people I looked up to growing up, they would have a movie and go on every talk show and do something like kind of buzzy. And then right. they'd go away for a year yeah. and make their next movie. And so I assumed, and I think mostly, mostly cause I wanted to erase my origin story. Like I wanted to be like, can I just burn the yearbooks and start sw over, swear everyone to secrecy. Right. 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 And they're like, no asshole. Like you're, you're, your yearbooks are on reruns on Nickelodeon, <laughs> <laughs> like, like solid. That's um, amazing. That's amazing. But when I embraced my origin story, when I was like willing to get vulnerable in order to hopefully be of service to someone else and be like, I was there too. And, and if you're struggling, you know, I hope I can give you a little bit of a reprieve from that and show you like, it's possible. 
that was when it it stopped having power over me. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, quickly, we have shit talking with Josh Peck. These are really rapid fire. I'm only going to give you a couple because we've been talking too much, and Please. you know uh, this is this is amazing. And uh, you know, I never like to do interviews longer than an hour. Uh, well, listen, right, right, right jo- or Ryan, mm-hmm. you know how I feel mm-hmm. about that. Agreed. So these are rapid fire, quick questions. Uh, these are for my patrons. If you join patreons.com slash inside of you, these are people who support the show in many ways, and I love you guys. And these are for you. What's your tears? What do you get if you like? What What's the highest tier? Do we get? Like, well, you'll have to look at it. Special incentives. You, you, know, you have packages from me every Package? couple of months. You know, you get like a box mm. full of cool shit. I love a there's, Patreon. You know, there's, oh yeah, there's uh, there's there's stuff. I'm there's signing stuff. up. All right, sign up. Good. All right, look here out. we go. Really quick, Maddie asks, enjoying your character on How I Met Your Father, and you and Hillary have great chemistry. Can you share any fond memories you have working on the show? Oh man, Hillary's just dreamy as hell. We actually made a movie together about 15 years ago when I was in my drug days and it was this little indie that not a lot of people have seen. And then 15 years later, when we saw each other on set, I was like, I don't know if she remembers that I was in that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple episodes in, I'm like, hey, remember we made that movie together? And she was like, oh yeah. And I was like, good, she doesn't remember. So Hollywood. I was not memorable at that time. <laughs> I was not memorable. I was like in the shadows, like grinding my teeth. Chelsea C, <laughs> if you had the chance to work with someone other than Ben Kingsley, because yes. that was like a lifetime change, change of a lifetime, chance of a lifetime. What you, am I trying to say? You fuck with Ben Kingsley? <laughs> is, is that the first time anyone's ever said that sentence? But she didn't. She didn't say that. Ben's King. I threw that in there. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, see then. If you had the chance to work with someone you look up to most in Hollywood, who would it be? Oh man, The Rock, obviously. Really? <laughs> I just look up to him in general as a human. I'm like, how are your Instagram captions so long? That <laughs> <laughs> was arms so big. Yeah, I just want to do a Jesus workout with him. Christ. Uh, Ryan, do you have anything? I mean, you're the same generation as Josh. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. How do you feel about our generation? But, um, give me a little more. Are we, uh, is social media screwing us up too much? Probably. But we're awesome. I, I, I think the corniest thing is taking shots. Like, it's become trendy to take shots at, like, millennials or Zoomers. I was doing a, a podcast the other day and this woman said to me like, so you do social media and stuff. Like, what about these kids, the Demelios and all these people on TikTok that are making all this money? Like, what do they even do? And I was like, I don't, I don't want to go there. I'm like, cause I don't want to be that asshole old dude who doesn't get it. Right. Like, I'm like, they obviously have something that has, has right. gotten them an insane audience and I have respect for it, even if I don't quite get it, because I'm. They're it's doing not their thing. Me. They're doing their thing. They're making money. They're doing. You don't have to watch it. You don't have to listen to it. No. Right. I I, I hear you. I could be the old bastard too. Oh. I could do the old bastard thing. I think we all can. Um, <laughs> Somebody wrote a great meme for the Super Bowl show, which was, you know, Dre and all this like great '90s hip hop, and people were like, "If you are hyped about this show, it's time for your colonoscopy." <laughs> I was so hyped for that show. Me I too. loved it. I thought it was the best because it was a throwback. It was my generation. Best it felt ever. good. It was the best ever. Um, happy people are annoying. Get the book. Uh, How I Met Your Father is on Hulu. You can watch that. Anything yeah. else coming up? Um, no, I have this movie called 13 coming out on Netflix sometime this year. Awesome. And what's your handle? Uh, at Shua Peck on Instagram. Are you going to follow me? I'll follow you. Hey, really? Yeah. Let's follow each well, other. Let's do it in front of each other. So, you know, I proof. think we should do that. I'll do it right now. Thanks for allowing me to be inside of you. This was a joy. <laughs> Dude, thank you. It really was. Awesome. Thanks, man. Man, drugs. <laughs> Drugs will fuck you up, man. Damn drugs. Fuck, drugs will fuck you up, man. Shit. You know, it's it, you either get through it or it just crushes you. And he got through it. There's only two ways. Yeah. You either get through it or yeah. you don't. Yep. Right? There's mm-hmm. no kind of, I mean, there's the in and out, but, uh, you know, the up and down sort of in drugs, yeah. out of drugs. But if you're in drugs and out of drugs, you're never really out of drugs. <laughs> Drugs are bad, okay? Drugs are really lousy. I mean, not all drugs. I don't think uh, marijuana is necessarily a bad drug. No. I think it's it can help a lot of people. I think it does. Yeah, it helps glaucoma. Yeah. It helps with uh, cancer patients. Yeah. It helps with my sleeping. Great. This whole <laughs> podcast could just be listing things that marijuana does good for. Yes, absolutely. There uh, you go. Thanks for listening again. Thanks for following us at Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Please write a review on uh, uh, Spotify or apple it means a lot it really helps the podcast and uh i appreciate it and even if you don't know the guest 
and you listen to it, or if you're here for Josh Peck, maybe next week you'll enjoy the podcast as well. You might learn something. So don't just watch for Josh Peck. We hope you stay with us. And everybody out there who's a uh, listener, uh, tell your uncle, tell your friends, get them to subscribe. To tell your uncle's friends. Inside. Tell, your, tell your uncle's friends, for God's sakes. I don't, I don't know what you want to do. And also, uh, again, the Inside of You online store. Go there. Get great stuff. Um, also, a big thanks to all my patrons again. And uh, this is one of the perks for the top patrons. You can go to patreon.com slash inside of you, and I get to read off their names. Mm. So I think we can get into that right now. Sweet. Let's do it. These are the top patrons. Here we go. Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Amelia O, Allison L, Raj C, Joshua D, CJP, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jen S, Jamal F, Janelle B. Correct. Roger S, Kimberly E, Mike E, Eldon Supremo, 99 more, Ramira, Santiago. Uh, Chad W, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya B. That's correct. <laughs> Maddie S, Belinda N, Chris H, Dave H, Spider Man Chase, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H. I didn't use my my glasses that are a little stronger, so it's hard in these glasses to see. Hmm. Spider Man Chase, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H. Congratulations, Ray. I won't say why, but thank you. Tab of the T, Tom and Liliana L. L. A. A. Michelle. K. Correct. Talia M. Betsy D. Chad R. Chad L. Mm. Rochelle. Marion. Meg K. Trav L. Dan N. Big. Stevie W. Big Stevie W. Sorry, Angel Stevie. M. Yeah, you're not boring, Stevie. Big Stevie W. Angel M. Rhiannon C. Corey K. Super Sam. Coleman G. Dev Nexon. Michelle A. Jeremy C. Cody R. Gavinator. David C. John B. Brandy. L. D. D. Yeah. Four. Yavor. Uh, Camille S. The. C. Joey M. Willie F. Christina E. Adelaide N. Omar J. Lena N. Eugene N. Eugene N. What? And Leah. Oh. Yeah. Chris P. Corey. Patricia. Heather L. Jake B. Getting to the bottom here. But really the top. You guys aren't the bottom. James B. Bobbitt. Ed A. Ed A. Mike. A bowl. Mm -hmm. It's a bowl, right? Mm -hmm. A bowl F. Yeah, a bull. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna get mad I hope at me so. again. I mean, he keeps. You know, I, I have no idea. I think it's. I'm, I'm gonna say thanks, Abel F. And here's another one. Thanks, a bull F. Keep them both. Yeah, keep them both. <laughs> Joshua B, Tony G, Sean R, Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, Annie, John B, Caroline R, Darren B, and Rob E. <clears throat> we uh, we love you. We appreciate you. And uh, thanks for listening to the podcast. Stay with us every week, please. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Be very good to yourselves. It's very important to be good, good to yourselves. Give yourself a break. Uh, Ryan, from myself, here in the Hollywood, in the Hollywood Hills, Hills of California. California. Yeah. I'm Michael Rosen. I'm Ryan Taylor. And a little wave to the camera. Good night. We love you guys. Thank you, for, thank you again for uh, joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.